Good morning. 11.35 a.m. my time here in glorious Woodstick, Illinois. <laughs> hey, watch out for guys in hockey masks tonight, huh? No, actually, this is synonymous with the Knights Templars because on a Friday the 13th, apparently, that's when the Templars were disbanded or something like that. Whatever, whatever. Hello. Please get your authorized version of the scriptures. And read along with me in the scriptures we're going to be looking at today. You need to read along with me because you need to see and hear what is being read. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Read along with me because I make mistakes. I'm fallible. Be a Berean. Search the scriptures daily whether these things be so. Get the scriptures. Okay? <clears throat> Pressure. <laughs> you know the word pressure is not in the authorized version of the scriptures? Check it out. Look for his... Uh, hey, oh, uh, brother! That that link that you sent me, you know, that you sent for everybody, uh, you know who you are. I couldn't figure out how to work that that uh, site that you sent me there, brother. I, I couldn't figure out how to use it. <laughs> i wait for your response on that later, brother. But... A brother of ours, Brother Alexander B. Hartley, um, as he is inclined to do from time to time, he will send out a little something-something for the body of Christ uh, amongst the brethren uh, privately. And yesterday he, he did that again, and he, and he is, he is um, renowned for this, and gives just little beautiful snippets, things to think upon. And um, he gave this thing about pressure yesterday. And it was, a, it was a real short thing um, that he sent. But I, I said to him, <laughs> I said to him, it's like, you know, brother, that's probably something that should be shared with the body of Christ. So like, go ahead. And then he responds, go ahead. It's like, ha! <laughs> so here we go. <laughs> something along the lines of the, what uh, was given yesterday. <laughs> so today is the 13th. Proverbs 13, just one verse to start. A wise son, wise wisdom, wise having the fear of the Lord. A wise son heareth his father's instruction. Now that's a lowercase f, yes. But see, any of you who are sons, any of you who are daughters, you have a father, okay? You do what your father says. You love your father, but you do what he says. And if you don't do what he says, he's going to whoop your rear end. Okay? This, this is a concept that is lost today in this society here, especially in America, in this feminazi, uh, woke, uh, demokami society that America is. And once the Jesuit order put in Kamala Harris, I have since, little rabbit, I have since changed my opinion on that. Um, who would be worse for America? Kamala Harris. Uh, I no longer think that the Jesuits are going to put in Donald Trump. They're going to put that Kamala Harris in. But anyway, that, that's a totally different subject for a totally different day. Okay? Totally different. <laughs> totally different day. But... A wise son heareth his father's instruction, but a scorner heareth not rebuke. You know, there are those out there who you can tell them the truth out of love, or you can get right into their face. They, they put their, their, their eyes are lofty, and they stick their nose up, and it's like, uh, well, if you had been through what I've been through, Okay, if you've been through what I've been through, you'd do the same thing. No, I wouldn't. The woman thou gavest me to be with, she did give me of the tree and I did eat. Like I told you this morning, okay, a wise son heareth his father's rebuke. A wise son heareth his father's instruction. But a scorner heareth not rebuke. And look across the page, the Proverbs 14, 
6 and 7. A scorner seeketh wisdom and findeth it not. Why is that? Oh, we'll touch on that real quickly here. A scorner seeketh wisdom and findeth it not. But knowledge is easy unto him that understandeth. Look at that verse. Look at that verse. Wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Departing from evil is understanding, and that will produce a uh, knowledge. Look at that verse. A scorner. Scorner. Uh, all you need to know about scorner is that it's not good. It's bad. Okay? If you're a scorner, that's not a good thing. Okay? Generally. There are cutie pies out there. It's like, well, I scorn evil. It's like, oh, okay, okay. But in a general sense, scorner, as far as scripturally, is not a good thing. That's all you really need to know. A scorner seeketh wisdom. A scorner seeketh fear of the Lord. And findeth it not. Hmm, I wonder why. But knowledge, knowing something, is easy unto him that understandeth departing from evil. Go from the presence of a ah, 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 foolish man. A scorner seeketh wisdom and findeth not. Findeth it not. Verse 7. Go from the presence of a foolish man. Fool says in his heart there is no God. Foolish to behave foolish or act foolishly is to behave as if you say in your heart or speak as if you say in your heart there is no God. Okay? That, that's simple. Okay? Go from the presence of a foolish man. Beloved. When thou perceivest not in him the lips of knowledge. Let's add verse 8. The wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way. And then also you can intuit about, okay, the way I'm going is not right. Okay, understanding is departing from evil, but context also understanding is um, comprehension. Okay, so the wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way. And when you look at it, and when you look at yourself, instead of blaming other people, <clears throat> it's like, oh, wait a minute, this is not good. But the folly of fools is to see. So in those uh, little um, uh, sandwich of verses there, you get a kind of a good idea what a scorner is. But now go back to Proverbs 13, verses 5 and 6. A righteous man hateth lying, but a wicked man is loathsome and cometh to shame. And see, these wicked people will not take shame unto themselves, but they are shamed in the fact that they are lying. Look at the free gracers. They're liars. They are, do not tell you the truth. They give you another gospel, another Jesus, just like Catholics, because free grace is a daughter of Rome. We're not, we're not going to go off on that, but I have to mention the uh, free graces and the scum that they are. But, okay, let's continue. Righteousness keepeth him that is upright in the way. Jesus Christ, he is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by him. But wickedness overthroweth the sinner. Proverbs 14, 2 and 3. <laughs> he that walketh in his uprightness feareth the Lord. There is with this a little dispensational difference. Okay? Because there's a lot, and, and dear brother brought this up uh, last night in conversation. The, prover the Proverbs are Beautiful for instruction and in righteousness. And yes, there are doctrine found within the Proverbs that does cross dispensational lines. Uh, fear of the Lord, okay? That, hello, McFly, okay? But you have to remember, in its totality, the Proverbs were written under the law. And a lot of the doctrinal things that are found within, not all of them, but a lot, a majority of the doctrinal things found in the Proverbs is for another dispensation. But the instruction and in righteousness for us today within the Proverbs, that's off the charts, dude. That, that's why you would do well to at least, 
you, you make all your excuses, you do this, that, and the other thing, you would do well to at least engage in a proverb a day. At least. Okay? It would do you well in the latter end. Okay? It really would. Of course, you should do more, but if you're just relegating yourself to that, okay, that's more than most. Okay? All right? So, yes, the proverbs are beautiful. Absolutely. Amen, amen. Um, I read them daily. What about you? Well, why not, huh? Why not? Shh. Anyway. He that walketh in his uprightness feareth the Lord, but he that is perverse in his ways despiseth him. Let that one roll around in your head for a little while. Verse 3. In the mouth of the foolish... One who behaves as if they say in their heart, there is no God, is a rod of, don't look at me, pride. You've been through what I've been through. Shut up. Shut up. Well, the woman thou gavest me to be what she did. Shut up! Shut up. But the lips of the wise shall preserve them. Shut up. Be a man, be a woman, and start taking a little responsibility and accountability for what you've done and quit blaming other the excuses, people. Again, excuses. They have to stop. And that covers a lot of things. You know, excuses to excuse sin, but excuses also to justify a certain feeling you may have. I spare you. Okay? So, a wise son heareth his father's instruction, but a scorner heareth not rebuke. Mm. You know, there are a lot of reasons why we encounter pressure, suffering, as it were. Now, the three main causes of, of sorrow in this world are what? Sin, sorrow, and death. No, the three causes of whatever are these. Sin, sorrow, and death. People can get cute and try to add four, five, six, seven, no, no, no. When you boil it them down to the bone meat of the matter, sin, sorrow, and death. But there are several reasons why you and I can encounter affliction, suffering, pain, whatever. Okay? And we're going to look at four of them today. Because you might be going through some kind of stress. Stress isn't in Scripture. Uh, uh, pressure isn't in Scripture. Being pressed down. Being pressed out of measure. Okay? Pressed. Pressing. Pressure. Pressurized. Pressing. Okay? We're not going to go off on that direction, brother. Uh, instead, this is the direction that was uh, given. Okay? So... What are some of the reasons why you and I might go through affliction? Why we, might, why we might be pressed? Why we might be going through pain? Why we might be suffering? Let's look at this. Four reasons. Sin. Suffering for God, for doing the right thing. You're sick. Or purification. Catholics... <laughs> Catholics, like Kent Helvin, um, have said, well, another reason is for purifying grace. Purifying grace. The, 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 the thought of that, the, the, and the way it's used, um, especially amongst Catholics, it, it adds to pride. Okay, and you got to watch out. Catholicism is, has nothing to do with the God who is. Okay? But, those are basically the four reasons why we might be going through something. Because of sin, 
because of you doing the right thing for God, sickness, you're sick, or purification. Jeremiah 5. Sin. Sin. Jeremiah 5. And now, see these cutie, cutie pies, like these vomitous free gracer people. It's like, well, there's no condemnation for those who live in Christ Jesus. Number one, what uh, Christ Jesus are you talking about? You're a Trinitarian. You ain't got the right Christ Jesus. And number two, <laughs> that's truth. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. But you know what? That doesn't mean that, that God will alleviate the consequences of your sins in your past life uh, eternally, eternally, you're forgiven. You go the way of the cross, broken, contrite, and in fear of him, call upon his name, and he saves you, seals you, everything, they, 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 it's under the blood. It's washed, it's squeaky clean by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. But see, and this is the gray area that them scum devils like to blur. And there is no gray area. This is what they like to bur blur. That doesn't mean that God will alleviate you of the consequences of the sins you have done as a lost person, spiritual body, or even the sin that you have done as a saint. It doesn't re always remove the consequences of your actions. For example, I have not all, but a good majority of these symptoms of congestive heart failure. Okay? Why? I was a cigarette smoker and a pot smoker. Hey, Bruce. Love you. Uh, what, what they used to do, uh, you used to smoke your bong or your joint, and you were somewhere, it's like what they say, smoke a cigarette because the cigarette will uh, cover the uh, scent of the pot, right? Right? And while you're doing that, you just cough yourself half to death taking a bong hit, and then you smoke a cigarette, okay? I did that for many years as a lost man. I'm forgiven of that, absolutely. I'm reaping what I have sown, okay? Even in context of things that we do as saints, we're forgiven of them, okay? But that doesn't, look at David! David who should have died! Because of the, his sin with Bathsheba, right? But he did. Well, oh, did David go through the ringer. <laughs> when, when, when we get a moment to maybe talk to David, uh, because we'll be too busy, and I agree with you, brother, we'll be a little bit too busy with the Lord, you know, it's like, wow. But, you know, if we, when we get the chance to maybe speak to King David, because he's, he's obviously up there, uh, I bet you he'd say, dude, I wish I would have never have done that. <laughs> and then you got these guys that's like, I wouldn't, have, I'm glad for the path that the Lord used to get me. I'm not. I'd have changed everything. You know what I wouldn't have changed? I wouldn't have still gone back, gone to a public school or a private school. Because even way back then, the Jesuit order was in control of it. But I would have, I would have done everything different. Okay? But see, here's the thing, and that's what these heretics like to blur this line. That, okay, the, according to them, and they don't have the right gospel or the right Jesus anyway, but um, it's like, well, you won't have to even suffer any consequences today for anything you've done. So go on and live it up. And that's not the truth. Okay? But Jeremiah 5, 20 on to verse 31. Declare this in the house of Jacob, and publish it in Judah, saying, Hear now this, O foolish people, and without understanding, which have eyes and see not, which have ears and hear not. Fear ye not me, and Christianity doesn't. Sat the Lord, will ye not tremble at my presence, which have placed the sand for the bound of the sea by a perpetual decree, that it cannot pass it? And though the waves thereof toss themselves, yet can they not prevail. Though they roar, yet can they not pass over it. 
You got to remember, in Revelation chapter 17, verse 15, you know, where in, a, in Revelation chapter 17, in general, the harlot, the woman, Rome, sits on uh, many waters, and the waters are likened unto people, nations, languages, and tongues. And you read about that in verse 17. So when you look at that verse, you know, and though the waves thereof toss themselves, Yet they can yet can they not prevail, though they roar, yet they can yet they not yet can they not pass over it. Excuse me. But this people hath a revolting and rebellious heart. They are revolted and gone. Neither say they in their heart, Let us now fear the Lord our God, that giveth rain, both the former and the latter, in his season. He reserveth unto us the appointed weeks of harvest. 25. Your iniquities have turned away these things, and your sins have withholden good things from you. And then these cutie pies who don't rightly divide the word of truth will try to use reverse psychology against us who do. It's like, well, Brad, that's in another dispensation. That's not for us. Um, if we deny him, he will deny us. Okay? That's not talking about salvation. Okay, if you deny to walk according as the Lord would have you to walk, you're not going to lose what's not yours to lose. His salvation, okay? But see, you deny him in your walk, in your in your conversation, verbal and physical. Uh, you, he can deny you a lot of things. Mercy, kindness, grace, compassion, provision. Oh, there's all kinds of things you can lose. But salvation you can't because it's not yours to lose. Okay? Uh, that's 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 on to verse 13. Go find it, okay? You, these cutie pies who do use the reverse psychology. Hey, Brad, that's another dispensation. Uh, but yeah, okay. Uh, uh, your iniquities have turned away these things, and your sins have withholding good things from you. Uh, you know what? Here, let, let's let's look at it, okay? You, you, the, you the cutie pies. You know, the, the pathetic, petty, uh, devils that we saints have to deal with, okay? Petty! Petty! And, I, and that's not Tom, brother. Stop it. I love you. <laughs> you thought about that, didn't you? you you're sitting there watching that. <laughs> you're, you're like, yeah, Tom Petty, huh? <laughs> I love you, brother. <laughs> uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2. This is a faithful saying. If we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer... We shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. That's not talking about salvation. Like I was saying, you deny and want to walk your own way, blame other people, huh? Not saved in the first place, but deny other people. Yeah, you know, deny, blame other people. It's always someone else's fault and do this, that, and the other thing. Yeah, yeah. But as a saint, you want to do what you're going to do, and you're going to do because all things are lawful for you. Yoke yourself up with Rome. Smoke them cigarettes. Drink that booze. Eat that sugar. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that high frocose corn syrup and all that nonsense. Oh, yeah. Um, deny you health. Deny you mercy. Can deny you all kinds of things. But see, you can't lose salvation because guess what? Yours to lose. Okay? Verse 13. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Ephesians chapter 5. Just one verse. Ephesians chapter 5, verse uh, 30. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 30. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Okay? We're not little Christ, but we are of the Lord's house. We belong unto him. Okay? So, 
It's not your salvation to lose. You can lose all kinds of things. So when you're looking at little sweetie, cutie pie, little cutie pie antinom antinomianism, yeah, you little sweetie pie. Yeah, so when you look at verse 25, your iniquities have turned away these things, and your sins have withholding good things from you. Yeah, well, that's in another, uh, shut up. Just proved you wrong, like all of free grace is. Okay, and then never mind about that. Let's continue. For among my people are found wicked men. Hey, hey, should should we make the reference to First uh, John chapter two verse nineteen? Should we? Or uh, in Galatians uh, about false uh, bre um, false brethren brought in unawares? Should we do that? Or do you know that one already? <laughs> okay, good. Let's continue. For among my people are found wicked men. They lay wait. As he that set a snares, they set a trap, they catch men. And also in Acts chapter 20 where they, you know, want, uh, want to draw disciples after themselves. They, I have not sent these prophets, but they ran. They want to be in the forefront. Hey, look at me, look at me, look at me. Huh? Huh? Yeah. Okay. We need to go there too. Or you got, you got, oh yeah, you know it all, don't you there, pal? Huh? Yeah. I'm not talking to saints about that one. Okay, let's continue. As a cage is full of birds... So are their houses full of deceit. Therefore they are become great and waxen rich. Cages full of birds. Oh, Revelation 18, reference on to Rome. Full of every hateful, unclean and hateful bird. Oh, like that stupid little bird of the Trinity. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Excuse me. They are waxen fat. They shine. Yay. They overpass the deeds of the wicked. I got to These free grace people are overpass the deeds of the wicked. Atheists. Even some of these guys who claim to be Satanists. They are in behavior more respectable sometimes than these antinomianist free gracers are. Especially circulated around that one praise that he isn't idiot okay yeah and then all the while they say well uh, I'm not under the law I'm under I'm, never mind okay but they do they overpass the deeds of the wicked they judge not the cause they don't look inward you don't look inward oh if, you, if you've been through what I've been through shut up you know how you know how revealing of the heart that is, dude, when you say that? Huh? Are you so deceived in your warped brain that there's nothing left up there, but it's all they, they did it. They they yeah, I did it, but it's them, 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 them. The cause of the fatherless. Wait, they judge not the cause, the cause of the fatherless. Yet they prosper. You know, itching people's ears, tickling their ears. Just for you ever save. <clears throat> and the right of the needy do they not judge. The needy need Christ. And these people are giving you a false Christ. Shall I not visit for these things, saith the Lord? Shall not my soul be a... God has a soul, huh? Huh? Well, that's right, because God is spirit, soul, and body. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Shall not my shall I not visit for these things, said the Lord? Shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? And <laughs> here we go with every denomination, including the precious, the astute, and the esteemed. You know, <sighs> the esteemed and astute. King James. Bible believing Christianity. A wonderful and horrible thing is committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely and the priests bear rule by their means. My people love to have it so. What will ye do in the end thereof? The woman thou gavest me to be where she did give me of the tree and I did eat. The woman, the devil made me do it. Jeremiah 30. We're going to hit this one twice 
but uh, a little later, okay? Jeremiah 30, verses 12 on to verse 15. And again, you stupid cutie pies. Well, that's not for us today. Remember, Brad, this is a different dispensation. There's no condemnation. You're right. It's not your salvation to lose. But as we already looked in 2 Timothy, dude, shut up. Just shut up, okay? You free grace pants them. Just shut up, okay? The Lord rebuke you, okay? The Lord rebuke you. Jeremiah 30, verses 12 on to verse 15. For thus saith the Lord, thy bruise is incurable, and thy wound is grievous. There are people out there who have gone past the point of no return, beloved. The impossible is possible with God. One could argue, well, you shouldn't really write everyone off, but you know, you know, when you got a certain bloke who's gone so far and just validates the depravity and lost state that they're in every single time they open their mouth, same with the rest of the guys out there, uh, <laughs> the probability, the possibility is undeniable. Amen. And if you're denying the possibility, that's heresy. But the probability, the reality is, uh, uh, they're probably not coming. And until a miracle happened, you would do best, and hey, this goes to you too, brother, you would be best to treat them like dung and stay away from them. And, I mean, yes, the impossible is possible with God. But see, when you cling to that, when someone who every single time proves to you the latter, that the probability of them being broken and coming to the Lord is not existent, yet possible, but yet you want to cling to it, you're, you're just asking for trouble. You're just asking for trouble. Like, like the Lord said unto Jeremiah, Let them return unto you. But don't you return on to them. Okay. Look at me. You. Beloved. You see? You're looking at me? Remember that. Remember that. The impossible is possible with God. Yes, it is. And to deny that is heresy. Yes, it is. But when you got people who every other day prove themselves that they're gone, you're doing more harm to yourself and think about this. How are you uh, purposely hindering what the Lord might want you to do? Not that you could. But remember, the Lord isn't forcing you to do anything. You keep that in mind next time you're justifying things. Please. 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 Okay? Okay, let's continue. There is none to plead thy cause, that thou mayest be bound up. Thou hast no healing medicines. All thy lovers have forgotten thee. They seek thee not, for I have wounded thee with a wound of an enemy. Ooh, I have wounded thee. I kill. I make alive. Okay? Deuteronomy 32. Okay? I have wounded thee with the wound of an enemy with the chastisement of a cruel one, for the multitude of thine iniquity, because thy sins were increased. Right here, verse 15. Why criest thou for thine affliction? Why criest thou for thine affliction? Especially when you know that you did something you shouldn't have. And see, it's a, why are you crying about, well, the woman you gave me to be with. The deflection. Yeah, okay, I'm guilty, but, it, but it, it's not my fault. It's always someone else's fault. Dude, look at me. Your excuses have to stop. What excuse are you going to go and give to the Lord when you stand before him at the great white throne? And unless... An actual brokenness happens. That's where you go. 
Okay? The excuses have to stop, people. Why criest thou for thine affliction? Thy sorrow is incurable for the multitude of thine iniquity. Because thy sins were increased, I have done these things unto thee. Then, if you wanted to continue reading, then you see the Lord shift in there to about his grace. But see, also remember, uh, Lamentations 3. Lamentations 3. I have done things. I have done things where I'm reaping what I have sown because of sin. And it's like, you know, let me, like David, um, you know, Lord, what am I going to say to you? You warned me. Isn't it interesting? A little rabbit here. Have you ever noticed Saint? When you do something, you know you shouldn't. And then in looking back, you realize that the Lord tried to warn you. Yeah, you know, am I the only one who, you know, like after the fact, it's like, Lord, you know, and you know, you'll, you'll reach a point in your walk, brethren, sisters, where the, why did you let me do that, will kind of cease, even though we still do it. You know, it's like, why did I do that, Lord? Why? And then the Lord will, you know, you know that, that chapter in Romans that you read yesterday? And then you go there, and then, then it hits you. It's like, you were warning me not to do what you knew I was going to do. Only a saint. Come on! Only a saint knows what I'm talking about. See, because the false, when they do something they know that they shouldn't, they justify it. We're not under the law, we're under grace. Hey, the more the more uh, sin I do, the more grace I have. So, hey, don't worry about it. Besides, it won't affect my salvation. <laughs> but a saint, you do something you know you shouldn't have done. Then you suffer for it. Then you get on your face, almost weeping, sometimes weeping. Why did I do that, Lord? Why did I do that? And then the Lord reveals to you after the fact. It's like, you know, if you were reading that the other day. You know, remember that verse that uh, you stopped on and it kind of was showing you something and you just, it's like, hmm. Then you go and do it and that was me trying to warn you. See, you, you heretics, you lost people, you Christians, majority of you, you have no idea what I'm talking about. But see, a saint does, because that's what we go through. You know, read Romans 7 sometime. Oh, wretched man that I am. How do you think, how do you think Paul felt when he was getting beaten up because he did what he shouldn't have done in Acts chapter 21? How do you think he felt? You think, you think? And see, these idiots would probably say, well, Paul probably justified. No, he didn't. Oh, wretched man that I am. There comes a time when it has to stop, brethren, people. I, I'm suffering for things that I did as a lost man and for mistakes I've done. Yes, I am. And what am I going to say? I was warned. But I decided, I chose, because remember, God doesn't force you to do anything, neither does Satan. But I made the wrong choice. Now i got to live with that consequence. And what do I do? Thank you. Your mercy, you know, Lord, just, what if you do? Please don't let me fall in the hands of man, <laughs> like David said. Uh, okay, I, you, know, you know, when he numbered the children of Israel, it's like, oh, wow, Lord, I've done foolishly. And then, <laughs> then God sends, and not Nathan, uh, one of the prophets to him. And he's like, I give you a choice of three things. Wow. Can you imagine what would happen if the Lord said to you, hey, you, you messed up pretty bad. Choose what I'm going to do to you. It's like, you know, you've had a father, you got a father, 
Okay, you go pick a tree from which to get the thing where I'm going to whoop your rear end with. <laughs> okay? Blame yourself. And see, you don't, you got to be careful too because you can get to a point in blaming yourself justly, but yet that can be elevated as a form of pride. You got to watch that. See, repent of it. Mourn over it, but go on. That was one of the things that a dear, lovely young man who I love very much, who I would like to speak to again. If you're watching me, you know who you are. I, I would like to have uh, the opportunity to speak to you again. I really would. I really would. But there was a young man, a dear young man, who I love very much, present tense, I uh, still pray for him, who was at that point, but yet it became a weird type of self-exhortation. And you got to watch out for that. See, we are to be mournful for our sins. We are supposed to weep for them. Yes, we are. We are to, Lord, you know, you confess your sin. And it's like, Lord, I'm sorry. Okay, please forgive me. Spend your time in grief, but go on. Got to watch out for that. But see, the time has to come where you got to stop blaming other. You know the finger that you point there, man? How many are pointing back at you? I, I, I blame no one but me. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. <laughs> Lord, have mercy on me. If you don't, you let me do better than I deserve. Lamentations 3, 26 on 43. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. Childhood and youth of vanity. Remember, for all these things, God shall bring thee into judgment. Therefore, put away childhood and youth, for childhood and youth are vanity. I just bradized that terribly. That's Ecclesiastes 11. He sitteth alone and keepeth silence, because he hath borne it upon him. He putteth his mouth in the dust. If so be, there may be hope. He giveth his cheek to him that smiteth him. He is filled full with reproach. Yeah, what am I gonna what are you gonna do? See that's that's what a lot of people that's what the person who makes excuses want to avoid. It's crippling, it's demolishing to your pride, and it hurts. But see. That's what a saint is. I blame myself. And let it come what may be, because I do, I'm doing better than I deserve. And I hope in your mercy. For the Lord will not cast off forever, thank the Lord. But though he cause grief, yet will he have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. For he doth not afflict willingly, nor uh, nor grieve the children of men. And that, amen, amen, amen. God would rather be merciful. God would have all men to be saved. But not everybody's going to be saved. Like the stupid free gracer, the universalist. You know, not everybody's going to be saved. Because God doesn't hold a gun at your head. Okay? To crush under his feet all the prisoners of the earth. To turn aside the right of, the, of man before the face of the Most High. To subvert a man in his cause, the Lord approveth not. Yes, he would much rather delight in mercy. But see, when you flip your nose to the Lord all your life, uh, he is a just God. Okay? All right? He, in order for him to be just, he has to do what? Be just in judgment. You flip your nose at him, he going to kill you. Sooner or later. You belong to him and you deny him and go on making uh, making him look bad. You don't get that straight now, uh, he going to kill you. Okay? That's the real God. Not the fake one that Christianity offers you. Who is he that saith, and it cometh to pass? When the Lord commandeth it not. Out of the most high, 
Out of the mouth of the Most High proceedeth not evil and good. I kill, I wound, I make alive. Verse 39. And see, until you are actually broken, naturally saved person, wherefore doth a living man complain, a man for the punishments of your sin, punishments, punishment of his sins. Now, eternally, you're forgiven. I have congestive heart failure. Who knows what kind of an esophagus thing going on? Who knows? Memories. Afflictions. Because of things in the past. I'm forgiven. But see, that's eternally. That doesn't mean that the consequences. Hey, for every action, there is a reaction. That, that's demonstrable, observable, and provable science. For every action, there is a reaction. Unless, of course, you know, you save yourself by your own belief and just go on it. What am I going to do? I did this to myself, Lord. I, you, know, you know, when I have a bad night, you know, I'm trying to give up sugar. But when I have a bad night, do what I can do, you know, with my heart messing up with me and whatnot. Just lay there and it's like, oh Lord, I did this to myself. If you're going to take me, you're going to take me. If not, you must have something for me to do. So what am I going to do? Just grin and bear it. Kind of like what David did. And here's the hard part. And here's what a lot of people, especially the woman thou gave us me to be with, well, the devil made me do it. Here's what they don't like to do. That's why, that's why these people are always accusing other people. See, it's a very telltale sign, dear saint, when someone who's claiming to be of us, and they ain't, refuses to look inward. And have this, Wherefore doth a living man complain? man for the punishments of his punishment of his sins it's a very telling sign it's a very telling thing dear saints when this is absent in someone who's claiming to be of us sometimes now we saints we get messed up every once in a while and we avoid the word because why we know what he's going to say oh we do see and that's when you need to be in this book. Not avoid it. Let us search and try our ways and turn again to the Lord. Let us lift up our heart with our hands unto God in the heavens. We have transgressed and have rebelled. Thou hast not pardoned. Thou hast covered with, an, with anger. Thou hast covered with anger and persecuted us. Thou hast slain. Thou hast not pitied. Now, here, here's the thing. And hey, hey, see this? Here's the thing that you and I really got to get through our thick heads. You know, unless you're a, you know, a Canadian talk show host or, or unless you're a Blackpoolian or unless you're a, a highly exalted uh, King James Bible-leaving Christian, um, most people, most saints the very first category that we're looking at a lot of our things that we encounter a lot not all but a lot are self-inflicted and if we would be honest with ourselves that hurts doesn't it yeah i know and see, it's that that Christianity wants to avoid. Number two, for God's sake, we endure suffering. Absolutely. Absolutely. I have? Absolutely. 
So have many of you. Okay? But see, uh, when you get into your head this warped, sick reasoning that while in sin, you try to justify your being punished for something you've done, but trying to justify it while I'm suffering for God. Again, that's a very telltale sign that they might not be of us. But another reason is, for God's sake, 1 Corinthians 4, verses 6 on 14. And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that ye might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written. We're all dirt. Why are you afraid of a man who's going to die like you? Why do you put a dude uh, with a plaid shirt on on a pedestal and treat him like a, he's a god and it even infects his own head to, for him to think he, him, he himself is one? I don't understand that. I get it, but whatever. Okay? That no one of you be puffed up for one against another. For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Whether it be good or whether it be evil. Hey, I asked for everything I got. Yeah, think about that. Aren't you glad that the Lord hadn't <laughs> answered all your prayers? What happened if he did? I'd be dead. I asked for everything I got did it to myself. Except for those times when I was witnessing, you know, got pop thrown on me, gravel kicked out at me, had tracks knocked out of my hands, threatened, you know, spit at, and things thrown at me, and stuff like that, you know, and uh, <laughs> use, I'll give you this, usually not for me always being aggressive, because I, I can be pretty aggressive out there. But, uh, yeah. Roll that around in your head for a little while, a little while there sister. Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? That works both ways, brethren. You've been given a gift, you've been given a grace, you've been given a, a blessing, you've received it from the Lord. You're getting the, the hade stomped out of you because you decided to exalt yourself above God and what He wanted for you? Think about that. Think about it. Think about it. Careful what you wish for, boy. Now ye are full. Now ye are rich. Ye have reigned as kings without us. And I would to God ye did reign, that we also might reign with you. For I think that God hath set forth us the apostles last, as it were appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world, and to angels, and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. By who? The world and Christianity. Even unto this present hour we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place and labor working with, working with our own hands. Being reviled, we bless. How do we bless those who revile us? They don't want to hear the word with our conversation of our body language, how we behave in certain situations. Being reviled, we bless. Being per persecuted, we suffer it. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world and are the offscreen of all things unto this day. I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. And yes, in our sufferings, being reviled, being persecuted, okay, the Lord who is in us, working out that which he put in, working out our salvation, our Lord Jesus Christ is our salvation. That is he that is being worked out of us. And that, how we handle, how we endure these things, is a testimony unto them. One dude slapped the tracks out of my hand. I, I, but I backed off right away. It's like, the Lord's like, Brad. I, I, you know, I'm, so, I'm that type of guy. I'm not afraid of men. 
I don't fret men or women. <laughs> okay, I, I, I'm not afraid of men. All right, I will stand up for myself and, uh, you know, every once in a while you get uppity with me, I'm your huckleberry. But in certain situations, stop it. Why? Because the way you serve the Lord reflects him. And the way you reflect him in suffering for the actual Christ and the actual gospel reflects him mightily. 2 Timothy 3, of course. 2 Timothy 3, 12, uh, 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 12 and 13. 12 and 13. <laughs> Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Yea, all and all that will, will live godly. Oh, you mean you have a choice in that? Yeah. Will live godly. Uh, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Oh, but evil men and seducers, just believe me, see, go to Christ's church, you're elect because of your skin color. Hey, your faith isn't even yours, it's Jesus's. <laughs> it's not funny. Uh, I hope that guy goes away. Anyway, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. 2 Corinthians 3. Uh, 2 Corinthians 1, 2 Corinthians 1, 3 and 11. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as, our suffering, for as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same suffering which we also suffer. Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation, meaning for your example. You know, filling up the sufferings for, of the body of Christ and lost people see how Christ who is in us is worked out in us when we are going through things? And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye be also of the consolation. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, Above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life, meaning we couldn't do anything of ourselves. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead. And see, Christianity is the opposite of that. They trust, free gracers, they trust in themselves, their faith. The object of their faith is their faith. Metaphysical mind science. Catholic. The object of their faith is a cookie. The Calvinist, depending on what flavor or what type it is, their faith is in the color of their skin. The Pentecostal. The, their faith is in what? Oh, I've got, well, not everybody gets the gift of speaking in. Blah, 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 blah. In the gifts, so called, not the one who gives it. But see, the one who gives those gifts to these people that I just mentioned is their father, the devil. That's a good one. <laughs> who, who's answering? The prayers, huh? huh? Who's answering those prayers of yours, huh? And that one video, which will be in the description box, uh, it starts off with John Boshoff. <laughs> anyway, let's continue. Who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver us, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. Ye also helping together by prayer for us, that for the gift bestowed upon us, 
by the means of many persons, thanks may be given by many on our behalf. And who are they thanking? Gets the glory. Gets the glory. First Peter chapter three. First Peter chapter three. Verses eight on to verse seventeen. Finally, am I, am, I, am I looking at the right one? Yes, I am. Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil, or railing for railing, but contrarywise, blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. How do you bless people who persecute you? By working out what has put, been put into you. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Like six out of ten people nowadays, they don't want to stand still and hear the authorized version. What are you left with when they will not hear the word? The conversation of your body language, how you behave, how you react. Okay? A lot of people can fake that. But... There's a certain limit, as with the Egyptians of Egypt, where they can't go and they shoot themselves in the foot. Okay? But we bless with truth by faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. And if they don't want that, then how do we behave as ambassadors for Christ? For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil, and his lips that they speak no guile. Uh, I think these free gracers ought to get a hold of that one. But then again, they don't have the right God and the right gospel. Anyway, let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? But, and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, now stop. The question in verse 13, one might be led to believe, well, no bad's ever going to come to me for doing what's right. Job, Job, okay, Job, and what happened with Job? Job, we're, we're going to briefly look at that. And the two videos about Job where we get in that in depth will be in the description box. But Job had a glowing report from the Father of the Lord himself. But yet he suffered. But he did. He was a good man. And the one who feared God and shoot evil. But yet he suffered. And someone like uh, a Christian would come to verse 13. It's like, well, see, if you're doing everything right, then no harm's going to come to you. So, but, but, and if, Ye suffer for righteousness' sake. See, this is what happens when people cherry-pick the scriptures. They'll read that. It's like, see, if some, you're, you're claiming to do be doing what's right, and yet suffering's coming upon you, you must, just like Job, you must be doing something wrong. <laughs> but, and if, what does this mean? Good things... Our bad things will happen to those who are doing that what is good. See, and Christians will cherry pick that and try to browbeat it on you too. You gotta gotta be aware of that. And right away, when you're confronted with that brother or sister, right away, well, if you know God wants you to be always high, happy, and prosper, and know that you know the Pentecostal prosperity guys are like this, and a warped version of that is free grace. But it's like, well, you know, nothing bad should be happening to you, so you must be doing something wrong. Okay, well, how do you explain Job? Throw that at him. But it's like, okay, if they go here, then it's like, oh, well, read verse 14. But, and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. 
The hope that is in you is Christ Jesus. That doesn't mean that, like they like to say, that doesn't mean that you've got to answer everyone's questions. No. No, because there are people who ask you questions to just draw you along in circles. No, if someone asks you, why are you all chill during all this? Well, I'm saved. Jesus, God the Father, dwells within me. A reason of the hope. Jesus Christ, he is our hope. Okay? Watch out for that. When they come to this verse and it's like, you got to answer everyone's questions. No, I, no, you don't. There are people who will ask you questions just to be disputatious and they don't want to hear the truth. Be aware of that. And in time, brother, sister, you'll be able to decipher that. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? See, Brad says it again, twice mentioned, right? To keep reading. But and if. Okay, now stop. Okay? They go to 13. Oh, you uh, see, you must be doing something wrong. God wants you to always be happy and prosper, but... Okay, verse 14. But, and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake. Ooh, okay. But then again, okay. Uh, but then again, it's like, uh, where, where was that? Um. <laughs> yeah, but uh, we just, uh, I just lost that. <laughs> anyway, uh, but again, like I said, you got to keep reading, but and if, okay? But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. Okay? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know where I just uh, like lost that. But anyway, the point is, but if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, suffer for what doing for doing what is right. But see, there again, they, some of these Christians, well, you ain't supposed to have nothing wrong with you or nothing going on. But bad things happen to good people. Bad things happen to good people, especially when you're doing it. And who is he? Who, uh, one second. All right, sorry about that. Sorry about that. So we see that there is a suffering that can happen to the saint for doing that which is right. Okay? We see that. And now also, sickness. Sickness. 2 Kings 13. 2 Kings 13. Sorry about that little thing that happened there. <laughs> but 2 Kings 13. 2 Kings 13, verses 14 on to verse 21. This is Elisha, not Elisha. Now, Elisha was the follow-up prophet of Elijah. And remember what Elisha did? He asked for a double portion of the spirit that was on Elijah. And he got it. And Elisha did lots of miracles. I forget, uh, so one of us gave the number about how many, but that, that's not the point. But with Elisha, the bulb that burns twice as bright lasts half as long. And there are incidences within the scripture as far as Elisha was concerned Elisha did have his moments where he had a little chutzpah. But the point is, Elisha, the great prophet, verse 14, hits you right away. Now, Elisha was fallen sick of his sickness whereof he died. The bulb that burns twice as bright lasts half as long. And Joash, the king of Israel, came down unto him and wept over his face and said, O my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. 
And Elisha said unto him, Take bow and arrows. Beg your pardon? And he took him bow and arrows. And he said to the king of Israel, Put thine hand upon the bow. And he put his hand upon it. And Elisha put his hands upon the king's hands. And he said, Open the window eastward. And he opened it. Then Elisha said, Shoot! And he shot. And he said, The arrow of the Lord's deliverance. And the arrow of deliverance from Syria. For thou shalt smite the Syrians in Aphek, till thou hast consumed them. And he said, Take the arrows. And he took them. Take the arrows. And he took them. And he said unto the king of Israel, Smite upon the ground, and he smote thrice, and stayed. And the man of God was wroth with him, and said, Thou shouldest have smitten five or six times. Then hadst thou smitten Syria, till thou hadst consumed it. Whereas now thou shalt smite Syria, but thrice. See, in his sickness, in his sickness, Elijah still prophesied and glorified the Lord. And look at this. Verses 21 to verse 21. And Elisha died, and they buried him. And the bands of the Moabites invaded the land of the coming at the coming end of the year. And it came to pass as they were burying a man, that behold, they spied a band of men, and they cast the man into the sepulcher of Elisha. And when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived, he revived and stood up on his feet. So even in death, the bones of Elisha, the proportion, a man back life. But see, Elisha had a sickness of where he died of. He was suffering. But yet in that suffering, he put his hands on the guy, dude's hands, shot the bow, and still used of the Lord for the glory of the Lord. Is that the case all the time? No. Sometimes you just get sick. Sometimes the sickness is for a better cause to glorify the Lord. And we will look at the one that you're all probably thinking about. But before that, Isaiah 38. Isaiah 38. Verses 1 on to verse 8. In those days, Hezekiah was... In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amoz, came unto him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. He was going to, you know, go to Abraham's bosom. But what does Hezekiah do? Then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and prayed unto the Lord and said, Remember, O Lord, remember now, O Lord, I beseech thee, how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. Then came the word of the Lord to Isaiah saying, Go and say to Hezekiah, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer. I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will add unto thy days fifteen years. So God glorified in mercy for giving Hezekiah fifteen years. <laughs> Let's continue on verse 8. And I will deliver thee and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city. Ah, so God giving Hezekiah 15 extra years. Look at verse 6. I will deliver thee. I will defend this city. His mercy and grace and sickness to Hezekiah was meant to be on to the Lord's glory. Why are you laughing? Well, I'll show you. Verse 7. This shall be a sign unto thee from the Lord that the Lord will do this thing that he hath spoken. Behold, I will bring again the shadow of the degrees, which has gone down in the sundial of Ahaz, ten degrees backward. So the sun returned ten degrees backward, ten degrees, by which degrees it was gone down. And, he, and let's read verse uh, uh, 9 and 10. The writing of Hezekiah king of Judah, when he had been sick, he was recovered of his sickness. And he said, In the cutting off of my days, I shall go to the gates of the grave. I am deprived of the residue of my years. And he goes on to give glowing praise to the Lord. But in those 15 years, 
2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles 32. 2 Chronicles 32. What happened in those 15 years? One name. Manasseh. Or Manasseh. 15 years. Uh, Manasseh was 15, year, 15 years old when he began to reign. 2 Chronicles 32, 24 and 26. In those days Hezekiah was sick to death and prayed unto the Lord. And he spake unto him and he gave him a sign. And immediately after the, he was recovered, you could read that, continue on in Isaiah 38. Hezekiah was like, praise you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. But Hezekiah rendered not again according to the benefit done unto him, for his heart was lifted up. Therefore, there was wrath upon him and upon Judah and Jerusalem. Notwithstanding, Hezekiah humbled himself for the pride of his heart, both he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So the wrath so that the wrath of the Lord came not upon them in the days of Hezekiah. But see, remember, Hezekiah ended in Isaiah um, uh, 39, where it's like, well, at least there will be peace and truth in my days. Yes, Hezekiah is in heaven. Amen. But Hezekiah's pride got the best of him. And in those 15 years, extra years, came King Manasseh, one of the worst kings in the history of the world, especially in Israel. But then again, Manasseh repented, got right with the Lord, and he's in heaven. Now, of course, John chapter 11, the one that you were all probably thinking of, okay, wanted to show other uh, examples of this, that the sickness can can be for the Lord's glory. There are some sicknesses that come uh, in line with the first category, a uh, consequence of your sin. Hello. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See this? You know, congestive heart failure. Uh, cirrhosis of the liver if you drink. Lung cancer if you smoke. Okay? Uh, warped mind because you've looked at porn all your life or whatever. Okay? These or you got some kind of, that can happen. Or it could be for the glory of the Lord, as we see in John 11. Okay? And remember, even in your sickness, even, even if it is your self-inflicted sickness, um, you can still give glory to the Lord. Example, Elisha. Okay? And do not be like Hezekiah, given 15 years, and in those 15 years came one of the worst kings in history. Okay, but John 11, 1 and 4. Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Wherefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, him whom, he, whom, him whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Obvious scriptural evidence that some sicknesses are for the glory of God. There's the one king, I forget which one it is, who was smote with an incurable disease in his bowels, and his bowels gushed out. That was a judgment for his sin against the Lord. Okay? All right? So, not every sickness is for the glory of God, okay? Some sickness is a result of sin. Some sickness, you just get sick, okay? But sometimes it could be used for the glory of God, and you're a sick saint in that condition. Even you can still bring glory to the Lord. And even in your incapacitated condition. I know of several brethren who have, you know, who have been um, limited, um, even in your limited position, you can still bring glory to the Lord in your state. Okay? And let's skip now to verses 25 and the 26. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. 
leave us all this? Question, was, did he die, bury, and rise again the third day according to the scriptures yet? No. Anyway, skipping now to the verses 41 and the verse 42. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, and I knew that thou heardest me, hearest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. So he did that for the sake of those who were seen. We talk about that in a video. I forget which one it is. I think it was the wrong God video. Regardless, the wrong God will be in this uh, 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 video in the description box. Okay? But, and let's read verse 43. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, Lazarus, come forth. Brought Lazarus back to life for the glory of God. A sickness that was for the glory of God. Philippians 2. Philippians 2. Philippians 2, verses 24 and 30. But I trust in the Lord that I also myself shall come shortly. Yet I supposed it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that ye had heard that he had been sick. For indeed he was sick, not unto death. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. And, okay, what happened after he was recovered? I sent him therefore the more carefully, that when ye see him again, ye may rejoice, and that I may be the less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such in reputation. Verse 30. Because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life, to supply your lack of service toward me. Ultimately in the sickness of Epa e uh, where was that? Epaphroditus, in that sickness doing the work of Christ, but also glorifying Christ. Remember, sick can be a sickness can be a result of sin. You can just be sick, or it could be a sickness that will glorify the Lord. Another cause of our sufferings. Either our sin for doing what's right in the sight of God, sickness, fourth one. Fourth one. This is where the wretched Catholics, Catholicism, and I hate Catholicism. I, I make no bones about that. I hate Catholicism. They call this a purifying grace. <laughs> but suffering for purification's sake. Hebrews 12. Now, chastisement usually becomes when we mess up. But there again, look at Job. Look at Job, which we will touch in this portion here. Hebrews 12, verses 5 on to verse 11. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as children. My son, despise not thou the chasing of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? Now chastening usually is the result of something that you have done wrong. Usually. Is that always the case? No. It could be used as a type of purification. Let's continue. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? 
But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh, which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather get, be in subjection unto the capital S, F, Father of spirits, and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. But he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Not that. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. Now, no chastening, you know what I was thinking, brother. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, and we've talked about this before, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Praise the Lord, I don't get to see the actual chastisement that you're going through, if you are. Sometimes we can see what a brother or sister is going through. And let me tell you, when the Lord is allowing the body to see the chastisement that he is putting you through, that's when you as a saint, it's like, boy, okay, number one, what am I supposed to learn from this? Number two, brother, sister, I'm, I, I'm praying for you. Uh, keep just keep looking at the Lord, and He'll get you through this. Okay, I, I've experienced that where uh, a brother has gotten some horrific chastisement that many were able to see, and it's like, it's like, okay, what do I need to learn from what you're allowing the body to see? And it's not just between you two. Number two, it's like. Weep with those who weep and mourn with those who warm, mourn, uh, mourn, rejoice with those who rejoice, you know. It's like, oh, oh brother, I, I love you. Uh, we're praying for you, man. Oh, that looks bad. I'm so, you know, you know. But see, when the Lord gets you through that, you learn from it and you get through it. The after effects of the chastening of the Lord is what you and I as saints can see and thus we can judge Job 5 Job 5 17 on the 27 now the thing you gotta remember about good old Job Job's three big mouth friends. They started out right. They came to him and kept their mouths shut when Job was going through what he was going through. But see, here's the thing. They speak truth. Yes, they did. But the error was that they were accusing Job of something that he didn't do. Like, like we already touched on. Well, like in First Peter 3. It's like, well, you must have done something. Why else would this be happening to you? But Job was a righteous and just man, one who feared God and eschewed evil. But yet, this happened to him. And see, Job's three friends, every one of them did speak an aspect of truth in the wrong premise. That was the problem. Because right here, this is, uh, who is this? Uh, this is Eliaphaz, I believe. Right? Right? Yes, Eliaphaz, or Eliaphaz. Eliaphaz, whatever. Job 5. Job 5, 17 on to 27. He's speaking truth here. But see, the error was accusing Job of something he didn't do. Behold, happy is the man whom God correcteth. Therefore despise not thou the chastening of the Almighty. But see, you, and we're going to look at these verses here coming up. Job was allowed to suffer for nothing he did. One and a bit. 
He shall deliver, uh, for he maketh sore and bindeth up. He woundeth, and his hands make whole. He shall deliver thee in six troubles. Yea, in seven there shall no evil touch thee. In famine he shall redeem thee from death, and in war from the power of the sword. Thou shalt be hid from the scourge of the tongue, neither shalt thou be afraid of destruction when it cometh. At destruction and famine thou shalt laugh, neither shalt thou be afraid of the beast of the earth. For thou shalt be in league with the stones of the field, and the beast of the field shall be at peace with thee. And thou shalt know thy, that thy tabernacle shall be in peace, and thou shalt visit thy habitation. And shalt not sin. See, he's speaking truthfully, but it's in the wrong premise in that he's accusing Job of something he never did. The two part video uh, thing on Job will be in the description box if you have any more questions. Thou shalt know also that thy seed shall be great, and thine offspring as the grass of the earth. Thou shalt come to thy grave in a full age, like as a shock of corn cometh in his season. Lo, this we have searched. Searched it, so it is. Hear it, and know thou it for thy good. That was absolute truth. Yes, it was. But see, again, Eliphaz was accusing and condemning Job, which God didn't do. That was the problem. So, Isaiah 48. Isaiah 48. Isaiah 48. Verses 9 unto verse 11. For my name's sake will I defer mine anger, and for my praise will I refrain for thee, that I cut thee not off. Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. For mine own sake, even for mine own sake, will I do it. For how should my name be polluted? And I will not give my glory unto another. Uh, you saints um, who are actual saints and you're living in sin, uh, you know, uh, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. That ought to kind of scare the, uh, the hell out of you. Okay? It's like, look, here's a, a saint who's messing up big time. He's a saint. And he's not taking correction, or she's not taking correction. You're coming home. You're coming home. Why? You're making me for my name's sake. Okay, you're you're you belong to me, and yet you're making all the wrong choices. A saint can do that. And then the Lord's like, okay. You there? You, you you know how you know you're no use to me here because you, you're refusing me and you're choosing contrary and you know you're denying me and I'm denying you all these blessings and whatnot and it's not working. You're my child, my son or daughter. You're done. Come with me. And then in eternity, the Lord will be ashamed of you. That's another thing that these devils like to blur that line. It's like, well, hey. I'll go home, and yes, it's better to be in heaven than to be in hell, yes. But see, that kind of mindset that these guys have, live in sin, and then, hey, I die, hey, I'll, at least I will know you guys won't. But you're going to be in heaven, yes, you will. Better than hell, amen. But eternity, the Lord will be ashamed of you because he had to kill you because you wouldn't do what he said. Roll that around in your head a little bit, brother, sister, okay? The next time you just as if I, hey, see this? See, see, see this? Okay, see. Okay? You keep that in your head. Okay? Jeremiah 30. Jeremiah 30. Okay? <laughs> Jeremiah 30. And, of course, you know, replacement theologists like to say, well, that was one day. You know, that, that's already... Shut up. Jeremiah 30, verses 4 and verse 9. This is for, like, a purification. And these are the words that the Lord spake concerning Israel and concerning Judah. For thus saith the Lord, We have heard a voice of trembling, of fear and not of peace. 
Ask ye now, and see, whether a man doth travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins, as a woman in travail? And all faces are turned into paleness. Alas, for that day is great. Heretics and devils of all. See, this was one day. It already happened. Oh, shut up. No, it hasn't. Uh, the day it commences. You know the when the day of the, the day begins the time of Jacob's trouble when we the body of Christ get out of here then the time of Jacob's trouble uh, begin. Don't fall for this while there's this little space before no 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 no. We get out of here. Madison is revealed when the body. Listen, listen. When the body of Christ is redeemed, caught up, that ends this dispensation. Then the time of Jacob's trouble immediately begins. Okay, don't fall for this lie, especially from some King, King James Bible believing Christians who tell you, "Well, there's a little space that is there before." No, no, Scripture does not support that. That's a teaching of a man. Hmm. Yeah, a man who was born in Topeka, Kansas. Anyway. Let's continue. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. Who's Jacob? Israel. The seven-year period of Jacob's trouble. The day it begins, that day will be great. When it begins. When does it begin? With the redemption of the purchased possession. There is no little, like, leeway kind of thing, okay? Well, there was with the death, burial, and resurrection... The three days, uh, he died, buried, and rose again. Okay? All right? The blood was shed on the cross. With that blood shed on the cross, that was the payment of sin. Okay? With the death, the burial, he revived in three days, but with the blood shed on the cross, he paid for the sins under the Old Testament. Okay? All right. All right. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved eventually out of it. For it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off thy neck. Whose yoke is that? That man of sin, the son of perdition, Satan, okay? Rome, but that's a woman. And will burst thy bonds and strangers shall no more serve themselves of him. But they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up unto them. Raise up to them. Raise up unto them. Has that happened yet? No. That's going to happen. Towards, you know, this coming. Okay? All right? And you got to remember this about Israel. Okay? See, the time of Jacob's trouble, Israel's trouble, is to get the Jews' attention to turn them on to the Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. Okay? All right? So, it's you can actually say that it's a type of a purification for Israel. But you got to remember this about Israel. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 1 on to verse 8. And remember, the Jew, the Hebraic Jew of Shem, not of Ham, not of Japheth. Okay? You got to remember this about Israel. Deuteronomy 4, verses 1 on verse 8. Now therefore hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you for to do them, that ye may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers giveth you. Ye shall not add unto the words which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. For your eyes have seen what the Lord did because of Baal Peor. For all the men that followed Baal Peor, the Lord thy God hath destroyed them from among you. But ye that did cleave unto the Lord your God are alive every one of you this day. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even the Lord, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that ye should do so in the land whither ye go to possess it. See, God chose Israel 
the Hebraic Jew, the Hebraic line, which came out of Shem, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God chose that line and established the Hebraic line out of Shem, okay? The Hebrews are Shemitic, okay? Deal with it. But see, God called them out to make them his representative representative onto the nations under the Old Testament. Prove that. Absolutely. Let's continue. Be keep therefore, verse 6, and do them. For this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations. Your fear of the Lord and your departing from evil in the sight of the nations. Law, which was faith and works. Today, the body of Christ. Ambassadors for Christ. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. When they won't hear the word of God, what are you left with? The communication of your body language. How you behave. How you react. Very similar. Very similar. The comparison is there to be had. The children of Israel were taken out of Egypt to be established as an example of the righteousness of God. Today, in this dispensation, God called us out of our lost life, Egypt, and have saved us that we may be ambassadors unto Him. Comprende? Let's continue. Which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. And how in hot days do these people do this when you got guys like... Tom uh, acting like an idiot, cussing and swearing all along. Huh? They, they're serving their God, Satan, well. They don't represent the true God who is. Okay? How you serve God, how you serve God reflects him, and that matters. Does it matter as far as losing something that's not yours to lose? Salvation? No. But see. The honor of the Lord is to mean something to you because you're supposed to love him. And if you love him and yet promoting profanity, uh -huh, or, or if you claim to love the Lord and blaming everyone but partially taking responsibility, uh -huh, for what nation is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? What nation is there so great that has statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you? This is why to whom much is given, much is required. Israel was given the Lord. And you read Lamentations, you read the prophets, what happened? <laughs> Some of you Christians think that you're going to skirt judgment? No, this is a good example of, of the Holocaust. Okay? The Holocaust. There was a, that, there's a good example for you. Yeah, Holocaust. A three-part video that uh, was done many years ago. The Holocaust, which happened during this dispensation. But there again, the Holocaust was a judgment. Okay? And they asked, well, where was God during through all that? That's going to be in the description box about the Holocaust, a three-part video. Go ahead and watch that one. Go ahead and watch that. Okay? But see, Israel is the apple of God's eye. And as Israel was, we in the body of Christ today are to be in samples, representatives of who the Lord is and his ways and how we are to demonstrate and be ambassadors for him. That's why we got to be so against all these fake people out there, brethren, because they're giving these people this idea of who God isn't. Psalm 119 Teth. Psalm 119 Teth. Psalm 119 Teth. Well, what's the matter? You don't know where Teth is in Psalm 119, huh? Why not? Why not? Well, mine doesn't have the heading, Brad. 
there are such of scriptures out there when it comes to Psalm 119 where it's all just thing. They don't have it broken up like it should. I'll give you that. I'll give you that. Psalm 119, Teth, verses 65, 172. Again, learn to decipher Psalm 119 by the uh, Hebraic letter, you know, Teth. Learn how to decipher it through that. If your set of scriptures doesn't have that, you know what you do? Like the Holman one, the uh, super large print one doesn't have the, you know, Keth, Teth, Kaf, Jod in there. Uh, you know, I, like I told my wife, you know what you do? You put the lines between them and then in the side column, which she did, uh, you put the things there. That's how you decipher it. Okay? Thou hast dealt well with thy servant. <laughs> Thou hast dealt well with thy servant? Uh, yeah. Uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 9. Okay, just very quickly. I don't know why I skipped over that, but... Revelation chapter 3, verse 9. Yeah. Thou hast dealt well with thy servant? You know, we read about chastisement. Uh, Re Revelation 3, verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Thou hast dealt well with thy servant, O Lord, according unto thy word. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I have, com for I have believed thy commandments. Judgment, knowledge, commandments. Judgment, knowledge. Commandments. Get it? Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now have I kept thy word. Thou art good and doest good. Teach me thy statutes. The proud have forged a lie against me. But I will keep thy precepts with my whole heart. Their heart is as fat as grease. But I delight in thy law. Yeah, because they're puffed up in their heart. It is good for me that I have been afflicted. Why? That I might learn thy statutes. See, when you're in affliction for whatever it is, sin, for God, sickness, or just to be purified, you, you know, in, in your affliction, brother, sister, that's not when you avoid the word. That's when you spend the most time in it. You're only reading the word when it suits you. Come on now. Come on now. Yeah. The law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. And what does Satan do? All this will I offer thee. If thou fall down and worship me, all will be thine. Huh? Yeah. Job. Good old Job. Oh. Proverb, where did we begin today? Dear brother, sister, huh? Well, today's 13th, Brad. I know that. A wise son heareth his father's instruction. A scorner heareth not rebuke. Job 23. Job 23. Not Nehemiah. Job 23. Verses 3 on to verse 10. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat. I would order my cause before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would know the words which he would answer me and understand what he would say unto me. Will he plead against me with his great power? No. But he would put strength in me. There the righteous might dispute with him, so should I be delivered forever from my judge. Behold, I go forward, but he is not there, and backward, but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand, where he doth work, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand, that I cannot see him. But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. A very beautiful and delicious irony for Job to say. That what? When he hath tried me, 
I shall come forth as gold. Job 8, like I told you, Job Job 1, verse 8. Like we saw in 1 Peter 3, you know, who will harm you if you're doing that what is good? But if ye suffer for righteousness sake, meaning that bad things could happen to those of us who are doing good things. Yes, it happens. Okay, yes, it happens. Job 1. God remember this about Job. Job 1, verse 8. The Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Wow, I wish I could have a, a report like that from the Lord himself. The Lord Jesus Christ himself, God our Father, said that of Job. God the Father said that of Job. Twice mentioned? Hey, there's one for you. Twice mentioned? Huh? Twice mentioned? Job 2. Job 2, verse 3. Listen to this there, friend. Well, you're, you're a Christian. There shouldn't anything bad be and happen to you. God wants you to prosper. He wants you to be in great health. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. We already kind of proved that wrong. Okay? It's according to his will. Okay? But Job 2, verse 3. And the Lord said unto Satan, the accuser of the brethren, by the way, Hast thou considered my servant Job that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Glowing review of Job by God the Father. You, you don't get much better than that, boy. Look at this. And he still, and still he holdeth fast his integrity. Although thou movest me against him to destroy him, Without cause. Bad things can happen to good people, and there's no, none good but God, right? I know I shouldn't say that, but if you're doing what the Lord will have you to do, you are doing good according to Scripture by following the Scripture. That's what I mean. I should, you're right, brother. You're probably going to comment that before you reach it to this point. But anyway, anyway. There is none good. No, not one. So you're right. But the point is, and you're right, there is none good. I shouldn't have been saying it like that. And I can see you commenting, praise the Lord, before this point where I acknowledge it. So, okay. But anyway, the point is, Job didn't do anything to warrant what happened to him. But what happened to dear old Job? Job's three friends, as we already touched on, accused him wrongfully when you see in these two appearances twice mentioned that there was no reason for Job to be afflicted as he was. He didn't do anything wrong. But still, something happened to him. But what happened? Job's three friends came speaking truth, but in error in that they accused Job wrongfully. And they wore on Job. It got to him. It, 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 it you know, fretted him. I mean, imagine you're going through Hades. And three guys who are supposed to be your friends, who are doing right at the first, keeping their mouths shut, and just ministry of presence, being there with you. And then one of them gets the bright idea. It's like, you know, dude, you, you had to have done something. You know, God chastens you for your benefit, speaking truth, but you had to have done something. And Job didn't. And see, they kept gnawing. They kept gnawing. They kept gnawing. They kept prying, prodding, and poking at him. Until Job made the decision to get a little uppity, to have a little pride. See, Job definitely had a reason for uh, acting and saying the things he did. But that was no excuse for him 
to show, yes, sweet humble Job, Job 26. Job 26. Job, because now, Job was being battered, the water weareth away the stones. Job was being barraged, was being endlessly barraged with accusation, which was unfounded. And his reaction eventually was a prideful one, which the Lord didn't like. Job had a reason for doing that. But see, there was no excuse for doing that because of the way the Lord responded to him. Job 26, verses 1 on to verse 4. And after, you know, uh, you look at verse um, uh, 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 chapter 25, you know, the shortest guy in Scripture, Bill Dad the shoe height. <laughs> okay. Uh, he was like, you know, his final. He was the last one of his friends, so-called, before he went on this tirade, justifying himself. And it's interesting, because he said, you know, when after he has tried me in the fire, I'll come out like gold. And he, Job also who said, if I justify myself, my own lips will prove me perverse. He said that earlier, but then again you see this. But Job answered and said, How hast thou helped him that is without power? How have you done this? How savest thou the arm that hath no strength? How hast thou counseled him that hath no wisdom? And how hast thou plentifully declared the thing as it is? To whom hast thou uttered words? And whose spirit came from thee? Ooh. That, that's, that's a prideful response. Job had reasons. But see. And see, Job is a perfect example of what we're talking about in this. Job shot off at the mouth in pride. He should, you look at that. Okay. And <laughs> note. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Get your little pen. One question, how hast thou helped him that is without power? Second, how savest thou the arm that hath no strength? Third, how hast thou counseled him that hath no wisdom? Fourth, and how hast thou plentifully declared the thing as it is? Fifth, are you, are you getting this? To whom hast thou uttered words? Sixth. To who and whose spirit came from thee? Six the number of man. Six the number of man. Job asked his three friends six questions. Job was battered. He was worn. He was being persecuted by his three friends who did a mixture of truth, undeniable, but false accusation of him doing something wrong. Job re reached a point where he was like, ah, couldn't control himself. He had a reason, but that was no excuse for doing what he did. Job asked his friends six questions. <laughs> Uh, uh, Job 38, after the tirade of Job and the young whippersnapper, Elihu, Elihu, okay, gave his peace. Job 38, 1 on verse 4. After all that, see, we have to be mindful of ourselves, brethren. While you may be going through a lot of affliction, maybe like uh, similar to Job, but hopefully nothing like what he actually went through, and people come around and start badgering you, you gotta be on your you gotta be on your guard. Because we heard, we just read the glowing review that the Lord gave to Job, but in Job twenty six, and like I said, we go through this quite in depth in the two part video on Job. But Job gave those asked those six questions in a very prideful way. And then you were to continue to read that on about Job 
his pride came out. Pride. Job. After everything he went through, but yet he acted proudly. What did the Lord think of that? Job 38. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? There are those out there, and I could uh, picture, you know, someone who tells you that the book of Revelation isn't chronological would say something like this. Oh, they was talking to uh, about Elihu. He was making, no, he wasn't. Elihu got passed over. Why there are many theories, you know, some his youth, uh, Elihu, Elihu even did also accuse Job but Elihu spake more truthfully than his three friends, and he was a youngin. Uh, one of the reasons could be that Elihu was just a youngster, okay, and he even says it himself. But the point is, when the Lord says this, who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? He was not addressing Elihu, okay? If anyone tells you if anyone tells you that he was addressing a lie, well, you're wrong. You are wrong. Prove it to you. Keep reading. Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. And we're just going to read the very first question. There's like something over a hundred questions that the Lord asked Job. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. And we'll stop there. See, the Lord didn't like the fact that Job got uppity and then in pride asked his friends those six questions. And the Lord is like, okay, out of the whirlwind, uh, gird up now thy loins like a man. Who, who do you think you are? For I will demand of thee and answer thou me. And where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Like, who, where were you? Who are you? Job had a reason. But that was no excuse. And the Lord's rebuttal of Job, not Elihu, was evident that, yeah, the, the Lord didn't like those six number of man questions that Job asked. Purification. Job 42. After it was all said and done. The purification. There was no reason why Job was allowed to go through what he did. The Lord himself even said that. But what happened? Through constant barrage, a reason, Job excused himself in pride and began to boast himself. We, we cover that in a two-part video. That will be the very first video in the description box for the references, okay? Uh, Job began to, like, if I have done this, if I have done that, if I have done this, I, 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 me, 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 it came out. The Lord didn't like that, so the Lord rebuked him. How? It's like asking him, well, he asked his friend six questions in an arrogant, uh, arrogant, prideful manner. The Lord's like, hey, hey. Ultimately, as with the children of Israel, during the time of Jacob's trouble, after they go through their purification, Job 42, 1 on the 6. This is the resident thing in a saint as well. We can dabble in pride. Oh, believe me. But a saint sooner or later is going to get out of that. Why? Because the Lord's going to bring him through the fire. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything, and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? And, and again, for those of you who are like, well, he was not. No, he wasn't. No, he wasn't. Therefore have I uttered that I understood not things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. 
Here I beseech thee, and I will speak. I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. He saw the Lord. Wherefore, I abhor myself, and repent, and dust and ashes. That's what's lacking in so many Christians. They repent because they get caught. Therefore, it is not genuine repentance. Turning from their selves, from themselves. These, these wicked free gracer guys who get exposed for their profanity, profo pro exposed for this, that, the other thing, they have a, a, a feigned shoe of uh, repentance, of remorse, uh, just because they got caught, not because they committed the infraction. The difference between a Christian and a saint. Zechariah 13. Zechariah 13. Purification. Sometimes we are, most of us, like I said, if we were honest with ourselves, most of us, unless you're, you know, a perfect Canadian creature or a perfect English creature, and hey, my saved brethren in Canada and uh, Great Britain, I'm not knocking you, certain devils, you know, and certain people from out northeast and certain uh, King James Bible believing Christians who, you know, are perfect creatures. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Most of us, if we're honest, most of us, suffer the consequences of things we've done. So a, a majority of us saints do suffer for doing right by God. Okay, we do. Some by sickness. Some are being purified. Zechariah 13, 7 unto 9. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, and against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered and I will turn mine hand upon the little ones. Jesus quoted that. And it shall come to pass that in all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be, shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. And I will bring the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined and will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name, and I will hear them. And I will say, it is my people. And they shall say, the Lord is my God. After the time of Jacob's trouble, when, you know, during, or it's during it, when uh, certain of Israel will be like, oh, wow. They'll get it and wake up. They've been brought through that, refined, and they accept their Messiah. And then the Lord comes down in the second coming with us who go up at the redemption of the purchased possession. And then begins the kingdom of heaven, which is by works only. It's not grace by faith. Watch out for these stinking devils, okay? <laughs> Malachi! <laughs> Malachi! I, I wish, I love you. I wish you never <laughs> said that. Malachi! Verses 1 on to 6. Behold! I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Reference on the Lord Jesus Christ when he first appeared, you know, the, the, um, when he arrived in Jerusalem and went into the temple. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller soap. Yeah, see, contrary to what Christianity tells you, the Jesus Christ of the Scriptures was extraordinarily confronting. The Lord Jesus Christ of the Scriptures puts his finger on that one thing you lack. But the, the Christ of Christianity loves you unconditionally. Doesn't judge you. He's not angry at you. Just believe, that's not the Christ of the Scriptures. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. 
Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord, as in the days of old, as in the former years. Has this happened yet? No. And I will come near to you into judgment. Huh. And I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, sorcery, pharmakeia, and against the adulterers, and against false swearers, and against those that oppress the hireling and his wages, the widow and the fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger from his right. And fear not me, said the Lord. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. And free gracers will point to this and say like, you know, well, it's, it's one mode of salvation throughout all scripture. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. Anyone with half a brain can read the Genesis account in Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3 that they saw God and they didn't need faith because they saw God and they had a work to do. Okay? Patriarchal period. Similar to ours but different. Why? No death, burial, and resurrection. No bloodshed on the cross. No um, indwelling of the Holy Ghost. And there was an element of obedience required. The law, faith and works. This dispensation, by grace through faith. Time of Jacob's trouble, faith and works. Eternal security only for the 144,000 Hebraic Jews. The kingdom of heaven, all works. Eternity, no works, no nothing. Why? No more sin. But the Lord doesn't change how God... Ah, <laughs> oh, dude. I, I, re I really, I really, I know that it's not going to happen. It will happen eventually that you sleazy believers will get your mouths shut eventually. But, I mean, dude, you got to rightly divide the word of truth. And it's not by grace of faith from the beginning to end. you got to rightly divide the word of truth. Okay? you got to rightly divide the word of truth. 1 Peter 1 on verse 9. 1 Peter 1 on verse 9. 1 Peter chapter 1, excuse me, 1 on 9. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers, scattered throughout Pontus, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the capitalist spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Hold your place. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. You know the blessed hope? Jesus Christ. There are a lot of people out there who believe in the redemption of the purchased possession, but like do this weird, try to separate the redemption from the purchased possession from the Lord as if they are two separate entities. The Lord is the redemption of the purchased possession. He is our hope. Watch out for these guys who do that. Watch out for that. Okay? Those are the same guys who, well, things are lawful for me. <laughs> Deck the halls with balls of folly, right? Anyway. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, through sanctification of the capitalist spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, 
being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found on the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, but yet Pentecostals claim, well, I've seen the Lord. No, you haven't. You've seen an angel of light. You've seen the devil. Yes, you have. You have not seen Jesus Christ. Watch out for these idiots. It's like, well, I've seen the Lord. No, you haven't. Whom having not seen, ye love. In whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your soul. John 15, which is probably what uh, some of you were thinking of right away. See, you, you got you to gotta stick with it, okay? You, you know, before you start commenting, you, you make sure that it's been covered before you do, <laughs> okay? John 15, 1, verse 8. I am the true vine, and my father is the husband. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it. Why? That it may bring forth more fruit. You know, you go through, through something that somewhere down the line, the Lord might use you to comfort someone else. That thing of purifying. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine. Ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. I think some of us saints really need to remember that. Especially a lot of you, especially you King James Bible even Christians. Okay? If a man abide in, not in me, he is cast forth as a branch. Dispensational difference there. And is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein, right here, is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. See, at the end of the day, it's all about the glory of God. <laughs> the way you serve your God reflects Him. And we're suffering for either consequence, sin, or doing right by God, sickness, or for purification. Press down. That is going to be it for this video. Thank you for watching this if you do. Um, and thank you, dear brother, for kind of throwing that morsel out there. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, like I said, this was, this was actually, uh, even though, I mean, the brother gave, you know, gave the thing. It's like, oh, I ran with it. So this was a collaborated effort. Thank you. Please keep your servant in prayer. Please pray for one another. I love you. Thank you for your prayers. And we will see you in the next video. Watch out for the guys with hockey masks, by the way. Bye-bye. <laughs>